Big Wheel, Kalen McNeil out of Edmonton, Alberta. Kalen, thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the show, man. Uh, thanks, Derek. Appreciate you having me back. Last we spoke, it was after you won the bracelet. Has it sunk in yet? I mean, that was a special time in your life, right? Yeah, I mean, the whole, that whole thing, obviously, it comes up every once in a while. And when I play, um, people ask me about it. And, yeah, it's obviously my the pinnacle of my poker career to date. Um, and something I'm super proud of. I'm wondering, uh, in Canada, uh, Grand Prairie, where you are, what's the typical reaction when the topic of poker comes up? Someone that doesn't play sees the bracelet. What What's their reaction to it? obviously is easily identifiable to the average person because it is on TV and there is an awareness there. Uh, obviously to the lay person, there isn't a lot of understanding of, of what it means to, to the poker community. Um, so they're kind of like, you know, a little unsure what it is. Like, did you win $10 million? It's like a <laughs> preliminary event. And, you know, it was only, you know, 280 or 270 or whatever it was. And, yeah, so there's a bit, but there's a general understanding. I mean, I think part of the challenge for poker players in the poker community is just trying to bridge that mainstream gap. And I think, you know, with all the publicity and, and growth of the game in the last, you know, eight or nine years, it's, it's we're breaking down the walls. Um, and, you know, with, you know, with the, you know, the GPI is doing with the Sportifying Poker, I think there's all those efforts are all still, um, you know, expanding and spreading the word about the game. And, you know, so the average person is starting to recognize it. Um, you know, obviously people in my community know about me and, and you know, sort of my accomplishments and stuff like that. But um, I think the lay person is still a little bit in the dark. But I always tell them it's like winning the Stanley Cup if you're a poker player because it really is special. That's what everyone's gunning for every year, right? The bracelet. Yeah, absolutely. I think... I don't think there's a poker player in the world, and you know it's that you know what I like the most is when I go to a new casino, and you know whether if they don't recognize me or hear about me, they'll soon find out that I've won a bracelet, and you know it's just seeing their reaction and how much they appreciate it. You just really just makes you feel good about the game that you're playing because these guys, you know, they're playing you know a two hundred dollar cash game or. $100 tournament or whatever, and everybody aspires to dream of, of making that big score and, and winning a bracelet or winning an EP title or a WPT title, all these things. Uh, these accomplish, accomplishments in the game is, is what helps feed the game, and it, everybody's got a dream, so that's, that's what life's all about is, is having a dream and achieving your goals. Absolutely. So where do you, where do you, uh, where does the bracelet call home? I mean, do you wear it much or have you got it in a special place? <laughs> it's actually in a closet uh, <laughs> in my house in uh, Victoria right now. Uh, I don't wear it that much. I brought it to a few casinos uh, because the poker managers were asking me to bring it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a trophy like, you know, I've got a bunch of BMX trophies from when I was a kid and, and baseball trophies and I think a lot of karate so I had karate trophies so it's kind of all falls into that category I mean I have a special place for the bracelet because I don't think a lot of you know people who don't play the game don't understand how emotionally um, you know fatiguing it is and painful it is at some time so there's a lot of emotions both joy and and despair in the game so when I look at it, it you know it can bring a tear to my eye and you know, my screensaver is a picture of me holding the bracelet just after I won it, and I literally am just looking at the bracelet, and, you know, it looks like I'm about to cry, and I did, the tear did come down. Like, it, it just it embodies such a such a, a moment in time. The average, the average person doesn't realize how many hours uh, guys like you are playing, and all the bad beats, all the times you've got ace, ace, deuce, three, and you get beat by some guy who's in there and shouldn't be in there and finally it all pans out and there you are holding the bracelet it's certainly you know it's it's the pinnacle right there so you, you, you that happens now it's your first bracelet and sometimes people say oh did he get lucky was it a fluke well the next year you come back in the same event and you almost win it again i gotta ask you was it a happy fourth place finish or was it a disappointing fourth place finish uh, i was really extremely disappointed um, at the time, like I, I don't think there's many. I mean, I've had, you know, 
things happen to me in my life where it's, you know, I want to put it in perspective. It's not like I wasn't going to jump off a bridge or anything like that, but it really took me probably three or four months to get over it. Um, there was a lot going on at the time. Uh, just the significance of the moment, I guess, is more what caught me. Uh, throughout that whole tournament, like the year before, I knew I was going to win it. So the whole time, I just kept that same focus and I just knew I was going to win it. So no one was going to tell me any different. No one was going to tell me how to play my cards. They're, I was just going to win it. This year, I felt confident, obviously, because I was the defending champion. Um, but day one, I ended up like third or fourth shortest stack in the tournament. Like I had 7,500 chips going into day two. Wow. And, but yet I still felt good about it. And I had a really good table draw on day two. It was like a perfect scenario where there's a whole bunch of mid stacks and only one big stack. And everybody was kind of around 10K or 15K. So no one was going to really get too funky. So I ended up building my stack up in the first hour or two to 45,000. And then felt great. I had a one outer with like 27 people left. Um, for my tournament life, and that sort of, I never looked back after that. And day three, I just kind of ran over all my tables and got four-handed with like a 2.2 million chip lead over second place, which had about eight, uh, maybe 900,000 or a million, and everybody else was below that. There's only four of us left. But that moment, it sort of hit me that I was about to repeat. I actually felt it was a bit, a, a bit like destiny at the time, and I after dinner break, Day three, I just completely ran like crap and was out the door fourth place. So I was really disappointed just because of the moment in history. Like, I'm a poker fan, and um, there's one other player in the history of, of poker that's won that event back to back. But no one's ever won a, a poker event of a, a thousand players or more back to back. So there was a, a bunch of, you know, and I had a rail, like, successful poker players so you know, although at the moment kind of hit me hard after when I when I, I felt like I failed it's really tough too because I mean like uh, the reason I asked that question is because sometimes you're 15 with 15 left and you're 13 with 13 left and you get to fourth and that's a good fourth I mean you climbed up but when you've got a chip lead and you're staring destiny in the eye and you think you're gonna go back to back which not too many people have done ever uh, it's got to be disappointing. You were at the final table with Greg Raymer, right? What, what was he like, the 2004 world champion? He was great. Yeah, I was. I that's, I played with him in a, uh, I played with him a few times before um, in sit and goes um, at the World Series, and I always really liked his table presence. And uh, he's a very decent decent player. Like uh, I know him from the no limit side, but I was surprised at how good he was at the uh, Omaha Inter better too. Yeah, his. His game was really, he got really unlucky to get knocked out. And uh, he was a short stack coming in, and he ended up chipping up really nicely and then just ran really bad. And um, yeah, I ended up getting knocked out, but he was really gracious, and yeah, I was really impressed. Yeah, he's one of those guys, I've met him a few times myself, and he always likes to talk poker. I mean, he's been good for the game. After, the, after a, a main event, some guys disappear. But he didn't. He stayed around, and he's given back to poker. Uh, poker's given a lot to him, too. So, Kayla, listen, you know my story. I'm heading to the World Series of Poker for the first time this year. I'm going to be playing event number three. Uh, that's Omaha High Low. That's your event, man. <laughs> well, you're going to have some trouble winning it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming for you. I like it. Do you remember the first time you went to the World Series? I guess you do. What was that like for you? It was good. I, the first time I actually played a World Series event... I actually was playing the Venetian Deep Stacks, and I don't even know if they, if they were called the Deep Stacks back then, but I think it was like 2005, and I ended up coming fourth for like 17,000 in the in one of the Venetian events, and then I was like, okay, now I'm going to go to the World Series. I think I played like three or four events. I went deep in, uh, in uh, limit, no limit mix, and uh, yeah, it was awesome. Like just seeing, you know, I remember I played with uh, JC Tran. You know, it just, you know, it basically reminds me of when I was a fan of the game. Still a fan of the game, but, but you know, I had really not many results. I was, you know, just trying to make a name for myself. And, you know, so I can really relate to, you know, you going to the World Series and what you're going to expect. And it's pretty cool. Like, it's, you get to see a lot of the players that you, you've seen on TV. And, I mean, it's a spectacle. 
Yeah, I can't wait. I love the history of the game. I, I just can't wait to walk the halls and see who I see. You know what I mean? It's going to be very exciting, and I, I hope to go deep in the event. I do like uh, Omaha High Low. What advice would you give a, a guy like me in terms of uh, style of play, no limit versus limit, when I go to this event? I think, I mean, you're obviously you can call a little bit lighter in, in limit. Um, understanding where you are in the hand is important. Um, no limit Omaha eight or better is pretty specific. It's there's a lot of pre flop. Um, you know your hand your hand strengths uh, need to go way up if you're going to get it all in pre flop. I mean it's correct to fold like really big hands that you would never think of folding. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you an example of a hand that I have no problem folding uh, because I learned the hard way. It's cost me a lot. I'm in early position. I've got ace king deuce nine rainbow. I've learned to fold that hand in no limit. Is that a hand I'm playing in limit from early position? No. No. That's, yeah. No. That's a, I think what I would do with that hand, um, I would probably, because of the ace king, you're getting quartered so many times. Right. That, and ace king is, is garbage. I mean, if you had ace, do, ace king, deuce, four, ace king, deuce, six, even, um, it's such, the hand strength is just way better then ace king deuce nine like you don't have backup for your low yeah the nine the nine is a bad card in omaha high low right yeah the nines don't do anything with for you at all um you, you ideally want to go in with you know some broadway type high cards but you, you want at least two low cards so ace king uh deuce four ace king deuce five right um that kind of stuff is way better. And then we just limp with a pre-flop. No reason. You're basically hoping you, you want to play a flop. So in multi-way, you don't care about because, you know, ultimately you're going to have some, you know, ace-threes and ace-fours in there that you want um, that will end up calling down. Um, and then you're going to scoop them. Scoop them. I, I like your point about having the backup for the low because, you know, there's nothing worse in this game than flopping uh, the nut low only to have a deuce hit on the turn, and, and then you're screwed. Yeah, if, if you know where you're at in the, in the, in the hand, it's, it's an easy pull. Uh, a lot of guys, especially in limit, the biggest trick in limit is not to pay those extra bets off. And mistakes that has happened to me in the past um, is leading with your low when it's getting counterfeited, and you're basically just, you know, then you got to pay off your, the raise, and you're paying off one more street. It's just like saving those bets. You just fold because... The odds of them betting something that is worse than your hand is like almost non-existent. In in no limit, uh, if I'm short, I might uh, decide to get it all in with a hand like uh, you know this is if I'm short with king king three four or queen queen deuce three. In limit, is that a hand that you're 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 hoping to flop a set with, or are you just dumping those ones? No, I would no. I play those ones for sure. Um, I my style is really aggressive in limit. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in there a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in a lot of hands. Okay, so let me give you a scenario then, Kalen. You're, you're in the big blind, because this is an issue that I have. I, I have trouble deciding what I'm going to defend in the big blind, and a lot of times I just fold it because I want to save that extra bet for three hands later when I get ace, ace, deuce, and want to get it all in. But uh, let's say you're in the big blind in limit poker. Um, there's an early raise, and there's three or four callers, and you've got, like, Something like nine, ten, Jack, Queen, or seven, eight, nine, ten. Are you defending from that spot? Oh, for sure, yeah, one hundred percent. Especially multi, multi way. I mean, people can say, "Well, you're gonna, you're gonna get screwed a bunch of times because you know the the seven, eight, nine, ten is gonna lose to the you know nine, ten, Jack, Queen, things like that." But you're you can flop pretty decent, and knowing other people's hand ranges, like if they're raising a lot with like their you know. Ace two three fours and you know things like that. Then you're gonna win the high hand a lot of the times. Okay. Um, especially when it's multi way. Um, a lot of the guys like any pretty much any ace deuce is gonna be in that hand. Any ace three is gonna be in that hand. So you know if the board comes middle, you're gonna you're gonna win. You could even scoop it. So yeah, you you definitely want to be calling the broad. I mean, I play my Broadway hands pretty aggressively in that game too. Um, I'll raise in late position with them. Because obviously, you know, if there's no low, you're going to win a lot of pots with no hand. Like, you know, because people aren't going to call you if they don't have a decent high. And if the low misses, then you're going to win the pot. So I win a lot of hands with, like, just say you can't bluff. 
I win a lot of hands with no hand, really. But knowing that they can't call because they're on a low, um, your hand reading's got to be good. But, um, yeah, you can play those hands. But to play them in position, obviously call multi-way out of the blinds with them for sure. Now, what about a hand like uh, aces? You know, you get dealt a premium hand and you're playing limit. Are you... Uh... Are you raising that uh, early? Or are, you, or are you just limping in and see what happens, trying to get more people in there? What's the deal with those kind of hands? Well, my really good friend Colin Burton, he's like probably one of the better Omaha players in Canada. He limps with those all the time, whether it be pot limit, no limit, or limit. Um, I'm a fan of, of raising um, pretty much from any position. And then just, you know, flop dependent, depending on how you play for. I mean, you've got the best grade. Obviously, if you're getting a bunch of pushback, you want to keep the pot small. I mean, this this is one of the – I got ace, ace, deuce, or ace, ace, three, three times when I was four-handed um, and lost on all of them, which basically took half my chips away and eventually busted. It's so frustrating. Um, yeah, it's frustrating, but, you know, in this situation, obviously you want to play your hand a certain way, but my mistake that I made then is basically bloating the pot, knowing that the guy's calling the flop – and there's no, there's no real low draw till the turn. Chances are he's got two pair of better, um, or he's on the high. So you're basically putting money in, hoping that your, your aces aren't really good anymore. So now you're really just on a low draw. And if you're leading, if you're out of position and leading those, those pots, you're really going to be spilling, spewing chips aggressively. Like check calling is correct. Um, but, uh, Building up big pots with aces isn't always the best way to do it, but pre-flop, you want to get money in as much as you can. You want to charge these people, right? And then if you have a low, chances are you're going to win that hand a lot of the times. So I think you know raising them is correct. Um, I think it's better. Raising is better than limping. It depends on your stack size, too. Obviously, if you're short, just limp with those hands for sure. Right. You, don't, you, you want to just get to a flop. Um, hopefully there's enough people in there that if you if you do hit the flop hard, um, you're going to go with your hand and you're going to win a decent pot. If you've got a big stack, you want to put pressure on people. Um, and you want to, you know, in position, you want to raise and re-raise, um, all that kind of stuff. Because, I mean, you've got blockers, you've got two aces, so the odds of them having ace deuce is, is decreased um, a lot. Um, so, yeah, you want to be aggressive with, with the hand. But if you're short, you just want to limp, see a flop. A lot of people, you know, they'll get into four, you know, three and four betting in, in, in limit and, you know, with aces and they'll basically, you know, keep, just go with it on the flop, any kind of flop. And it's just a mistake. You, in limit, you want to preserve those bets, especially if you, if it's reasonable based on the flop that they have you beat. No, I'm looking forward to it. I've set a goal and I don't know if this is correct even, but I've set a goal to make it past day one. Uh, so that's that's what I'm looking for, and then I'll reassess after day one. I fully expect to make it past day one. That's that's positive thinking. Now, listen, I know that you love this game, and you know I was one of these guys that just played Texas Hold'em all the time. And for whatever reason, I read an article on Omaha High Low. I played a tournament that day, a two dollar tournament, and I cashed, and I was hooked. I know you think this game is super fun. Why is it is it is it more fun than say Hold'em? It's, well, it's way more fun because it's way more social. Um, like, you're not, like, every hand is in your, you're evaluating your total tournament life. The game is fun because so many things, so many cards change the entire hand that you can go one way, you know, in a certain spot, and then all of a sudden something completely changes, and you have to make a complete adjustment. Like, it's just a funner game. Um, there's more people, there, you play more hands. Um, there's more people in the pot. Uh, yeah, there's just, it's just a, like this and sometimes, sometimes you get lucky and get chips back when you don't expect it. <laughs> well, well, this is it, exactly. I mean, there's so many different ways to win, and, um, it's really surprising, and if you, you know, once you get to the point where your, your hand reading skills are good, like, there's a lot of bluffing in it, and you gotta win a lot of pots with nothing. I mean, I, call, I remember two tables left last year, I called, like, multi-way, you know, three and four bet, um, you know, flop turn and not, you know, just one bet river with like an eight high flush and I was good and I took half the pot. So there's, and it was a three way, three or four way you know, to the river. Right. And you just, in certain situations, you just know you're good. That's a good and, spot right there. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody looks at you like you're, you've got three heads. <laughs> you call it an eight high flush. Like, well, I knew I was good. Well, how do you know? Like, it's just like, you just... Eventually, you pick up. The, it's just a fun game. Right. It's just it's fun, and it's one of the, the the. I mean, I remember the first time I registered for the 08 um, limit at the World Series. It was um, I think it was like four years ago, and I was so mad because I thought it was pot limit. So I think I was out in the first like two hours or something, and I was like just that was the first time I'd ever played the game. 
was so annoyed with myself that I registered. Uh, I was just like, oh my god. And then, you know, two, then I never played it again until the year I won. Never played at the World Series again until the year I won the bracelet. Wow. I, I've entered three WSOP bracelet events of this, and I've final table two, and won one and came fourth. And uh, I've been, I'm, like, that's what, I mean, obviously winning for two million games. Yeah. But it's such an enjoyable, I mean, it's mostly what I play online too, like all forms of Omaha, but um, it's just such a fun, fun game. And like I said, it's growing. Like that year, I think there were 600 people in that event. And then, you know, the year I won it, it was 1,016, and last year it was 1,038. Like it's a fun Wow, fun I'm looking forward to this so much. It's going to be exciting. Uh, I had a vision the other day, live stream WSOP.com, Kalen McNeil with a 4 million chip lead. On myself, but guess who wins it, baby? Bracelet on my wrist. That's the vision. You got to think positive, right? You do, and I'd take that right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would take a second, too, believe me. 